Welcome, fellow travelers, to Live from the Labyrinth, a podcast that beckons you into a realm of wonder and introspection. Here we embark on a profound exploration of the storytelling genius of Britt Marling and Zalba Manglij. Live from the Labyrinth is a space created by neurodivergent individuals so that like minds can find solace, understanding, and acceptance. It is a space that cherishes the unique perspectives and experiences that arise from minds that dance to their own rhythm. We embrace authenticity where the raw and unfiltered truth of our story shines through. We navigate the realms of belief where the boundaries of what is possible are stretched and redefined. We unravel the threads of myth where ancient tales and archetypes illuminate the human experience. And we bask in the enchantment of magic and mystery where the extraordinary becomes an integral part of our lives. Through captivating conversations, thought-provoking discussions, and immersive storytelling experiences, Live from the Labyrinth offers a portal into a world where the lines between reality and fiction blur. Together, we will navigate the twists and turns of Britt Marling and Zalbot Manglage's narratives, uncovering hidden meanings and discovering new dimensions of understanding. So whether you are a devoted disciple of their work or a curious wanderer seeking a path less traveled, we extend a warm invitation to you. Step into the labyrinth, leave behind the constraints of certainty, and let us embark on a journey of self-discovery, connection, and limitless imagination. Welcome to Live from the Labyrinth, where vulnerability is strength, authenticity is truth, belief is liberation, myth is revelation, and magic is the essence of our shared human experience. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Live from the Labyrinth. I'm Nick. I'm Ashka. Ashka. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about episode five, written and directed by Britt Marling. I think probably (laughs) my favorite episode so far. Um, I really feel like I entered the story finally. Like it's taken me a little bit of time. I was talking to Ashka like last, you know, last week when we were recording the episode for episode four, that I felt like a spectator kind of like looking from afar Mm. and really felt like this kind of FOMO, like I was missing out on the story somehow. And I realized that like, I just had my door closed and Mm. I finally kind of opened up and was able to enter the story. And I don't know about you, Ash, but this was like quite the episode. It really was quite the episode. Um, I enjoyed it. I'm so happy that you had a good experience of it. I mean, I also had a good experience of it, but I felt like I was, I wasn't able to drop into my body as easily in this one. I stayed in my head and in my like racing thoughts the majority of the time. So that was the first time that this happened for me in this series. And so we kind of had like, maybe opposite um, reactions, but definitely parallel at the same time. Like it was, it was definitely a different experience for me this time around. Roller coaster, nevertheless. No, I, I agree. I agree with the roller coaster. I think the biggest thing for me, well, there's two, there's two like main visceral reactions that I had. The first one was when we enter the elevator, mm. we drop down 10 floors into Andy and Lee's fortress, into their bunker. And I just felt like I was going deeper. It felt very Russian doll. Like I was going deeper into the story, deeper into the narrative, deeper into Britain's all's world. And then we enter into Lee and Andy's space. And it's so like surreal. And like the architecture is so grand. And it reminded me a lot of, um zoomers uh virtual reality helmet Mm -hmm. space it just felt like we really entered like the subconscious or like the unconscious of this story somehow and that really that really gave me some like oa vibes like i was like what's going on here oh definitely it was a big parallel when they were when um darby was going down that elevator and you started to like you saw all the numbers going down, like all the stories, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you start seeing like just rock. And and that was like, Oh my gosh, that's very, very haps basement. Um, You mentioned something about the surroundings, like um, where they're living. And I, I also got 
castle vibes, which was very interesting because Andy Andy mentions a couple things about like royalty. He says that he wants Zoomer to be King Arthur. He calls himself a king. Right. I'm a king, Darby. I know. I'm a king, Darby. It's like, okay, calm down, sir. Right, but, right. <laughs> like, I get it, but please. Um, he also um, calls Darby a page. In a stale so a, court. A page in a stale court, exactly. So, like, there a fresh was page. a lot. Yeah, there was a lot of... Um, like castle imagery a again it did look like zoomers um augmented reality game helmet thing um so that was cool and i also something that came to me when you were talking about you felt like you were going deeper in the story well you're 10 stories deep boom 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 but -bum, bum like you're literally going down dropping into the i don't know i don't know no, I, I agree. So my second visceral reaction or like what really stayed with me, and I think it might tie into one of the things that frustrated you about this episode, but entering or like highlighting or bringing to the surface Darby's addiction, mm -hmm. Darby's um, coping mechanisms and her self-regulation, her self-medicating habit of using drugs was such a kind of profound and important piece for me to see Britain's all telling this story because I mean my you know my my late best friend Courtney who passed away like Jesse I saw so much of her in this character I saw so much of myself in my early 20s mm -hmm. and I wanted to like shake Darby the whole time Oh, and be yeah. like, what are you doing? But I feel mm -hmm. like that is the archetype of an addict, of someone who is controlled um, or at the mercy of their impulses and their drive, someone who hasn't had enough life experience, um, which I don't even want to be like the old guy that's like, it's because she's young. But like she's in her mm -hmm. early 20s and um, clearly has some trauma stored in her body that she's you know medicating and trying to cope with this crazy experience of being at a tech billionaire's retreat solving a murder i mean right. what chaos is that and the way that she's coping you know i saw a bunch of people on discord like it kind of caused some controversy um it definitely triggered i think a lot of people to see this side of darby all the what substance abuse yeah, yeah 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 the substance abuse piece was you know, a lot of people had actually kind of clocked Darby as an addict before, like previous to, like way before this. And it didn't actually, I guess I needed it to be much more clear for me to be like, oh. And so I was one of those people who I I didn't, I didn't see any of the signs of her um, necessarily abusing substances, though. I mean, you, she, she was like, partaking in some you know recreationally right, right. Um, i didn't see it either for the record like not i didn't see it because it made sense like when she took when she took sleeping pills which by the way are those that was xanax and oh, was it? the reason the reason why i know that is um lol my own history but mm. I feel like um one of the things I heard Britons all talk about was they really wanted to get like the tech right because they said it's really corny when you're trying to watch um, a show and they have like fake websites and fake, you mm. know, so they really spent, they really fought, uh, you know, I heard this all say tooth and nail to get like Reddit and Dropbox and like all of these sites. Mm -hmm. I also, they didn't say this explicitly, but I also feel like they really did their due dil diligence. And I mean, that was, that's literally Adderall when she was crushing it up. Like that is what really? brand name Adderall looks like those blue pills were definitely um, Xanax. So it's like, I feel like they, it really is, they really are honoring the story of people that struggle with addiction by mm -hmm. showing the like reality of it. And it was just, it was a, I don't know. I feel like, should I have said that I <laughs> recognize those drugs as uh, real? But um, I just think that Britain's all are really paying attention. 
Oh yeah. No, I had no idea. Thanks for telling me that. Um, so yeah, like to see her really go through it and think that she's helping herself by, I don't know, like, like I mentioned to you and I think I mentioned in the, in the discord chat, the night that it dropped, like it's, it's a misguided attempt at self-regulating. Um, but yeah, I was also like, it made me worried for her because I'm like, mm -hmm. ma'am, you're taking uppers and down. basically what Bill tells her in, in the motel room scene, like you're taking uppers and downers. You literally, your brain is literally swollen. You just had a, a another close brush with death. Right. Can you please sit down for a moment? Right. And um, it also became evident to me, like how much truth was in the statement that Bill made in the very first episode, which he was like, you know, Darby, whatever you have that you, within yourself that you consider bravery, I don't know if it's that. Right. Mm. And I don't know if it's stubbornness. I don't know if it's like an intense, all consuming hyperfixation, which, you know, I, I can relate. Um, is it obsession? Like, what is her driving force? Like, she obviously had this, like, really, I don't even know, this this driving force behind her actions that made her impulsive and reckless even before Bill died. So I don't, I'm not even sure that it's, like, solving Bill's, uh, Bill's death that is, is the driving force behind this. You were talking about, you were asking, um, you know, what was the driving force? One of the, mm -hmm. one of the pieces or the discords or the reasons talked about in the recovery and addiction circles is that a lot of people who suffer with um, the kinds of coping mechanisms, drugs included, but the kinds of coping mechanisms where you're just, you're trying to fill a void. There's this emptiness, you know, there's that scene where she's talking to Ray about how she's felt this way for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, she doesn't want to be awake anymore. A lot of people who are struggling with any sort of darkness describe this inner void, this abyss um, that they're trying to fill, to feel whole, to feel love, to mm -hmm. feel worthy, to feel um, deserving to be here. And so I, I see that a lot. And I think that um, Darby's got some trauma. I mean, we don't know the story of her mom. Um, we don't really know what her relationship with her father is like. She didn't grow up with siblings, at least, yeah, we don't see any thus far in the story. So it's like she really grew up pretty alone. And we were um, just kind of still talking about our visceral reactions. Yeah. So um, I just really, I just think it's really important that Britons all are telling this particular story um to see a woman as brilliant as darby um genuinely brilliant like she has so much potential she's so smart but even the smartest people the most brilliant people are often plagued um and mm. it's just to see to th to see this it just was like strangely it was heartwarming because i'm like mm. i know I know that person. I have right. had a Darby in my life. Courtney, Courtney was a Darby. She was Aww. the smartest person I've ever known. So brilliant. So with it, but just at the mercy of her body and her drives and her impulses and wow. trying to fill that void. So that's why I think I had such a reaction to seeing Darby in this light. Yeah. I think that we definitely should have a conversation about, um, how Brit and Zal portray drugs and drug usage in their work, um, both, I guess, street drugs and also uh, like medication type drugs. Mm -hmm. As they, I believe if we kind of put some of those pieces together, we'll see that there is probably a message behind that. So we should definitely look into having a conversation about that whole show. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, with me, it was, so I wrote down in my notes, a couple of, a couple of the things that I felt number one, 
I was completely shocked at just how much Darby's drug abuse was going to, or substance abuse was going to play out in this particular, in the whole story, to be honest, let alone one episode. I'm like, oh, wow. I can't believe I didn't notice this before. Like, this is actually going to play a bit, like a major role. Um, I, I was also kind of just kind of stuck in my head because I became aware at some point, I'm not even, I'm not even sure exactly where that point was, but at some point I just realized that the story is almost over. Like the story is wrapping up. Oh, you mm. know what? I think it was probably Sean's death. Like that made me realize that this, like, oh, they're wrapping up storylines. Like, oh, like it made me sad. Like it made me kind of like start delving into a little bit of the, a little bit of grief, which I didn't expect either. Um, but then after that happened, I was just very aware that like every minute that the show kept running was like one minute less that there was left of the show. Mm. And so it was kind of like, to me, it felt because I, I, I experienced lucid dreaming. And so there's a point in a dream where I will come to and I'll be like, oh, snap, I'm, I'm, it, this is a dream. And depending on if it's like a really good dream, like I don't want the dream to end. Mm -hmm. And I was very much in that space, um, almost to the point where like I couldn't pay attention. <laughs> like I had to rewatch the, um, I had to rewatch it before, a couple times before we even had this conversation because I kept getting kind of like, I don't know, sucked back from the story just by that feeling. Um, and also there was a point where, you know, at this point I'd really been finding Darby a relatable character. And there were points in this, in, in this episode where I also found her, you know, a little bit relatable, but I started to become annoyed at her. Mm. Like it start, I started to have that type of feeling where you want to yell at the person who's on the other side, who's like in the movie. Like I started getting that feeling um, mostly um, this might be controversial, but it's just my opinion. She started reminding me of Bella Swan from Twilight. <laughs> like when Bella, I don't even know what movie of the Twilight series this was in, but there was, there's this one storyline where Bella Swan um, starts putting herself in like all these dangerous situations to basically call back um, Edward, to call back her vampire boyfriend, to, to mm. like bring him back into her life because he had like distanced himself. And I was just, I don't know. That was, it just made me roll my eyes so hard. Like, oh my gosh, please get it together, Darby. Freaking heck. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit annoyed. But by the end, I was just like, I, it's like I would flip the table. Like, you know what, dude? You want to go? Why would you go into a pool? Like, like I don't know. Right. Like you're like meeting a stranger that like lured you to the pool and you're just going to pop in. Yeah. It, it just became too much for me with Darby. Like, I, I, I was like, I, I can't with you anymore right now at this moment. So I feel like <laughs> I feel like that says a lot um, about. Britain's all's writing then because I feel like you care about Darby. It's like she's now someone in your circle. So your annoyance is just coming from a place where like you want to see her succeed and be safe and not make these stupid decisions. Is that, I do. I, 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 I definitely do. Like I wanted to see her like, but I also understand that it's a story and like they got to wrap things up and there's only a couple episodes left. I also don't see, I, I mean, we're at, we're at the end of episode five and I still don't see them wrapping up all these stories in two episodes. I just don't, I, I know that there's going to be unanswered questions. I know that there's going to be a big mystery at the end of this. I, well, I shouldn't say, I know, I feel like I know. And yeah, I just, um, I feel so like it's not go for it. Oh. Um it's funny because I totally 
I totally get you. And I, and like, I felt so many of those things towards Darby mm -hmm. too, but the way that I also felt about it was like, that is what a young 20 something year old substance user who has not slept in days. Like I just, I, again, it, I was like, I know that character, like right. those are all of the things I'm like, Oh, like, it reminds so you, me of you me. understood the accuracy. You understood yeah, the, the accuracy. situations that I would find myself in, where I'm like, "What are you doing here?" Or the situations I'd see some of my loved ones in, because they were at the mercy of their impulses, mm. not making good decisions. And I'm just like, that is just to me. It made Darby so much more human. As mm. even though I was annoyed with her, I was like, oh, "But I also see you." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. Any favorite scenes? Mm -mm. Um, wow. Do you have any? You go first, because I'm trying to think. So my favorite scene, I think, oh, well, it definitely had to be the scene with uh, Darby and Lee in Zoomer's mm -hmm. bedroom. Um, I loved, you know, Lee kind of like showing her teeth at like, at, yes. at Darby like that was awesome like I, I if Lee ends up being the killer I'm all for it get her Lee <laughs> like honestly like I, I would love for Lee to be the killer I would love to see Britt Marling play um just an irredeemable <laughs> villain like I I don't know I'm here for it um I'm T I'm team Lee be the killer. Um, me too. Me too. It reminds yeah. me of what um, our friend Kristen said recently about like Lee being the shadow or being a shadow of OA or a shadow of Hap, I think she said, or shadow She's of Andy. Shadow incarnate. Yeah. The yeah. Shadow incarnate. And I, I'm with you. Like I really, I think that if Britain's all made Lee the killer, it would force us to confront OA's multidimensionality um, because there would be a dimension where OA, Britt Marling, and another body is is the shadow, is an irredeemable it's character, bad, bad. you know, yeah. that, and it would like really balance, I feel like it would really balance the scales um, right. in a way. And, and, you know, for the record, I actually don't think that Britt and Zoll are in the are in the business of writing irredeemable characters um, True. or irredeemable villains. I think even, I think the term someone, I read this on Reddit um, that Hap isn't an irredeemable villain. He's instead a Byronic hero, which is like, or a Byronic villain, I think. Um, what so, does Byronic mean? It's it's like this term. I don't know much. I don't know that much about it to where I can talk about it to be honest. But yeah, it's this term fair. that was like coined from like Lord Byron and the type of stuff he would write, I suppose. But you know, it it it's basically that you know someone's not irredeemable regardless of whether or not you know they do bad stuff. And, Ooh, and can I, I read? A, that, can I read a quick like little definition because it like. Go for it. It. Byronic yes. heroes are marked not only by their outright rejection of traditional heroic virtues and values, but also their remarkable intelligence and cunning, strong feelings of affection and hatred, impulsiveness, strong sensual desires, moodiness, cynicism, dark humor, and morbid sensibilities. Mm -hmm. I really did like that Reddit post because it, it was very, it was very nicely articulated. Thank you for reading that. Um, so yeah, I don't think that they they would write, you know, just some awful. Thing. But you're right. Um, seeing Britt Marling play um, like a cruel character would help us not only because that's not even like that's 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 part of like regaining your own humanity. Like that's that's part of, you know, all of us, all of us have that potentiality for like pure evil and, and cruelty right and this like the ultimate good and and to and to say otherwise is is nonsense to be honest it's 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 is inhuman really it's inhuman it makes someone inhuman it robs a character of their humanity it robs a person of their, of their humanity so yeah i think that you know the fandom can take it um 
I agree. But yeah, I think that was my favorite um, scene with Leon Darby. I also really enjoyed um, Andy's scenes with Darby because I, yeah, I, I felt like it was about time. Like we have not gotten enough Lee or Andy in this story as of yet. Like we are, we literally have two episodes left. I know. And I hope to see way more of those characters. Um, it's been, I do remember seeing like a, a critic writing about how they had such an ensemble cast, like brilliant actors, but that mm -hmm. one of the um, criticisms was that they wanted to see more of these characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yep. just a testament of Rittenzall's world building and their character development because you can feel the density of these characters and it's like we're, we want to know them more, which I think says a lot. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing Clive Owen absolutely freak the fuck out. I I I shared in his sentiment, you know, by five episodes, I still can't trust one fucking person. <laughs> Andy, like, same. And I really enjoyed, the, the Clive Owen fan in me really enjoyed seeing Andy say this line that Clive Owen has said in, um, a couple times now that, that I know of in his work, which is, thank you for your honesty. That is a line from one of my from my favorite work of his, um, Closer, which he says a couple times in that um, in that movie. So that was cool to see. I love those scenes too. I feel like um, I loved seeing Darby and Andy team up. I mm. loved just the discourse between them. We got to see, you know, I'm just kind of um, echoing a lot of the things that you said. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I feel like I saw more of Andy's humanity and I just, the writing is so good. I felt like, I don't know. I, and then it's like so many characters had surprises. I loved the piece about, um, Oliver and David. It was so oh, like yeah. spicy. Um, I spicy. love Lume. Um, my favorite scene now that I'm thinking, aside from that whole, like that whole beginning of Darby and us getting more of Lee. Also, I want to talk at some point a little more about like Zoomer's room, but I think my favorite scene is the um, Darby and Bill when they're driving, um, they're driving across or they're, they're yeah. like they're driving across Utah and Bill is trying to tell Darby that he loves her and she's on her phone <laughs> um, on, on reddit you know on, yeah. on instagram wherever she's at and it was just such a relatable experience when you're like trying to connect to someone in the moment but they're behind they're the screen so, yeah like yeah. tangled up in their screen and then you know they pull over and i loved bill like walking away from him and darby it was just such a like symbol or, or, an, or analogy of like walking away from technology and like getting back into nature and getting away from the screens and how like that's what got Darby's attention is him like, you know, kind of walking away. And then that conversation that they have about technology, um, right. I thought it was, it was brilliant. I mean, they, they touched on so many. Yeah. That, um, that conversation, it was really interesting. The one that they had, like when they were sitting down, in the desert, they're like sitting down on a log. Um, I kind of like how Darby kind of has the last word in that in that conversation because she's like, "Well, I first found out I was falling for you because I was on my phone. It was like on my phone." So it's like, yeah, the internet has its power to connect us, and I think that's what we have to extract from it. But definitely, we have to accept the invitation to step out from behind that screen and like live our lives, um, you know, not from behind a glass. We need to, you know, be able to connect with people. Um, or to find balance I too, I think, to find the balance between technology and, um, and collectivism. And I just, it was just a great, it was just a beautiful piece of writing. And mm -hmm. then I guess then my next, um, favorite scene um, was when Bill and Darby got in that fight. Um, in, the, in the hotel all, room. 
Yeah, when she's all high and um, she figures out the serial killer and she genuinely finds it. Like she figures it out. She is brilliant. She put all the pieces together and she wakes Bill up in the middle of the night, shakes him awake to tell him her amazing revelation. And then he just like, are you high? And just like yeah, deflates, I just deflates mm -hmm. all the work that she's been doing because she wasn't completely sober while she figured it out. And that was such a relatable experience where, you know, I've definitely have had some moments like that in the past. What about mm -hmm. you? Like, what do you think about that scene? I have some thoughts on that scene. Um, first of all, how did that fire start? After rewatching it thrice, I've rewatched it and I still can't figure out how that fire started because she lights a joint with the regular uh, lighter, not like one of the lighters that would like stay lit. Hmm. Did she leave or, her? Did she like leave her joint? I mean, I guess that would have happened. I mean, that's a possibility that she left her I joint. I mean, if, if you rewatched it, then I trust that like maybe, maybe it, there's, is it like some kind of supernatural? Did it really happen? Exactly. Like I'm, that was weird to me because I can't, I mean, the obvious thing that I, the obvious conclusion I could, I could draw was that, you know, it was from like the cherry on her, you know, like the, the little lit part of her joint, but like. It would make the most sense for the story that it was her joint because then that's like another consequence of her addiction. Right. I invite you to rewatch that scene and, yeah. and try to figure out exactly how that happened so yeah. fast or exactly what happened there. And but, if any um, of you know who are listening, please comment and let us, I know. <laughs> let us know what you think. Also, um, um, yeah, that, that hit me pretty hard, not from a substance abuse perspective, but from a neurodivergent perspective, because when I get into these like hyper-focus states, um, I can be up like I am on drugs and I, my thoughts can race. And instead of what's my typical, um, state, which is when I struggle with communication, I become hyperverbal. You know, all of a sudden I'm talking a million words per minute and everyone's like, okay, calm down. You're scaring me. Like I've definitely had those. Um, it's almost like, it's almost like mania a little bit too. Mm. Um, which I've also had my, uh, I've had to face a couple of times, but, um, you know, to the person experiencing it, it feels like a flow state. And then to the people witnessing it, it seems like you're watching a car wreck. It, like it, and, Right, right. Yeah, it, it's something that can like scare someone, you know, who's who's witnessing that state. Um, I also realized in that scene that that's not the first time that Darby has woken up Bill in the middle of the night to like tell him some grand re revelation. She also, she calls him earlier in the show she would like she i forget exactly what she figured out but she's like holy crap and she like calls him at 3 a.m and he's like what are you doing it's 3 a.m and she's like i found this and so i wonder if bill at this point is like realizing like oh, i've kind of had enough like what is going on i don't know um that was my feeling on the whole situation on that whole scene the the motel room scene I'm glad that you brought that back up because it does show um, how like substance abuse can kind of fly under the radar if you don't know what to look for. Cause I hadn't even thought because, you know, I'm, I'm a night owl, I'm up um, late mm -hmm. and I'm not on amphetamines. Um, so like I wouldn't have really thought anything about it, but now with all this new information, the, the future, informs the past and the past informs the future. It really does kind of um, rounds Darby's character out in terms of my understanding of her journey. Right, exactly. Um, any other scenes or sequences that really hit hard that you can think of? What did I have in my notes? I mean, the ending. Um, oh yeah. Already, I mean, whoever communicated with her in Morse code, um, which leads me to believe, I saw some theories online that maybe Sean isn't really dead. Um, 
I hope that she isn't, but I mean, no evidence to support that, but I had just seen it. But I feel like Darby had talked to her about her dad teaching her Morse code. And so mm -hmm. Sean knew that she knew Morse code, although maybe that's common knowledge. That's a good point. Yeah, but, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. You know, and you know what? You just actually point you you just made me realize something that something that I read and that kind of made me sad, like, oh well, they're they're wrapping up these storylines. You know, Sean's death was a little bit too clean and packaged and convenient, to be so honest. Weird. And like, what did she die from? She had a trach. Like, it's not, that's, I mean, that's pretty serious, but like, she was talking to like, but she did tell her yeah, like, what, like a, what a way to go. So what like, way I to don't, go. yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Unless they're all in cahoots and like, they just needed to like make her invisible so she can, I don't know. I, what I, is <laughs> even happening? but someone was communicating with her through the lights Mm -hmm. and gets her to go down to that pool, which is already like another example of Darby. Like, what are you thinking? Like you're already, mm -hmm. you've been, you've been tackled to the grounds by a faceless man being threatened um, to not go any further into the labyrinth. And now you're just going to go willy nilly down to meet a stranger that's communicating with you through Morse code. Like it just, a very odd thing and then oh i know she gets into the pool um which i also like even though all of the like recklessness aside mm -hmm. i was like mm -hmm. viscerally happy like <laughs> i was cold too so like i also wanted to get into the water mm -hmm. so like there's just a part of me that like enjoyed the sensory aspect of it but then the top goes oh, over yeah. Enter NDE from drowning. Like that's where my mind yep. went immediately. Like, what in the OA was that ending? That was very OA. I mean, the the banging on the aquarium, so to speak. Um, what was something something that struck me as very OA from that sequence uh, was that she dips into the water. And she the water is allowing her to access certain memories. So we end up getting some additional scenes from that desert scene. Mm -hmm. um, they hooked up. It was showing them hooking up in the desert right after they were sitting on that log. So my that kind of like shoots down a previous theory that I had that Zoomer might be Bill and Darby's because it looks like they hooked up and the psychic said that Bill was gonna have a kid with someone he hooked up with only once. And now we see them hooking up more than once. What do you mean the psychic? I'm saying only once, not more than once. So the psychic's prediction was that Bill that Bill is gonna have a kid with someone he hooks up with only once. Wait, and what is I don't remember the psychic. What was that? What's that from? You don't remember the psychic? No, no. Okay. In the previous episode, Bill tells Darby that his mom used to visit a psychic when he was a kid and that the psychic told his mom that he was going to have a kid. He was only going to have one kid and it was going to be with someone that he hooked up with only once. So I took that for like, I took that and ran with it. Like, okay, well that means that, you know, Zoomer could potentially be Bill and Darby's kid because we only see them hook up once to that point. But then by this episode at the end, we see them hooking up again through this like lost little clip of like this little memory that she remembers when she's in the water. Right. And I, that struck me as very OA because, you know, the water is, is allowing her to access these memories. Um, Cause like, why, sh why didn't she remember that before? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that, if that water sequence was her, was, was it like sensory? Was it, like I said, something for her to retrieve memories or was it some sort of integration experience that she was about to have before it turned into like near death experience um, territory. So that was a cool little um, connection that I was able to make. Okay. Okay. My theory is dead. My, the my theory has died. That's I no okay. longer yeah. I no longer believe that Zoomer could be Bill and Darby's kid. Although who knows? Right. Um, can we talk about Lee and 
Marie Larson. The party with city that, wig. With that, <laughs> with that, uh, yeah, party <laughs> city Rachel wig uh, or Renata season or part oh, two wig. Oh, that was Renata hair, wasn't it? And she was going to Argentina. Um, yeah, Who I do she? not know. I do not know where to where to place that. I don't know. And you didn't seem surprised by it when no. Darby was telling everybody everybody's secrets. Andy. That's when his tone changed. Like, remember, they're in the hallway, and he's she's trying to be like, "I found a passport, you know, uh, and an alter ego, and um, in your wife's purse." And he's like, "You have a brain injury." Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but he didn't are... really seem surprised. Like, maybe, like, are they both who they say they are? There's no way they're both who they say they are. Like, I think I believe. Just even outside the story, I believe that rich people are just, they, they're full of secrets. Um, and I think it might stem from the fact that, you know, they can't trust anybody. So they end up having to have all these secrets. But um, yeah. Okay. So you mentioned earlier, like how Britain's all had, you know, they really tried hard to bring in elements to the story that were real, like the real Reddit, the real Dropbox that they even use like real medications mm -hmm. or like real Xanax or whatever they used was not that it was real Xanax, but it looked like it was real Xanax. Yeah. 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 It was recognizable. And, yeah, exactly. I just want to give this shout out to the, the wig, the wig department of, um, <laughs> Of murder at the end because the wigs have been on point. Like you, you, Nick, you and I have talked about for years. Like one of the things that can that makes me suspend belief, <laughs> or, or sorry, not that it makes me suspend belief, but it makes me not be able to suspend belief are bad wigs. Mm. And so far, the wigs on a murder at the end have been just top notch. And so to see Marie Larson's wig, I was like. Oh, that, oh my God. I'm glad, I'm glad this is coming at episode five and not like in episode one, because I would have been taken out right away, immediately just taken out. But um, also like the cheapness and the flimsiness and the shininess and the, and <laughs> the stiffness of that wig. Um, and like the thinness makes me believe that, that, yeah, that's kind of like, is it a red herring? Is it like a false, like? I mean, yeah, that it might be like a false type of of narrative or something. Um, it's supposed to be conspicuous. Like you just, anyone wears that wig, you're going to look super obvious to like, you know what I mean? That it's a wig, super, super obvious that. So anyway, yeah, I'm not, I don't really have fully formed ideas about that other than I found that wig hilarious. And then who even like who even has a wig in their bag at all times? Right. Like right, like you're ready to flee right now. She was ready like, to flee. At, at any moment, she was ready to like rock and roll with her wig. Lee was ready to flee. She was <laughs> Lee was ready to flee. That's so funny. Um, um okay, and that scene in Zoomer's room. Okay. Um, when she tells Lee that she told Andy that Zoomer is Bill's kid, and she's like, "You said that to my husband." Um, the fact that Andy knew and Lee didn't know Andy knew, oh, and yeah. then it made her sick. So that made me believe that like that really was a piece that Andy didn't have that now he does. He had a visceral then, reaction. And then Lee comes out of the bathroom as she's snooping through her shit wig and passport. And she's terrifying. Terrifying. Like the scariest yeah. I've ever seen Britt Marling. And we know Maggie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's like, I'm not even mad at you, Darby. Like, oh my God, run. And then, you know, Darby can't escape. She's in this situation where she's like, okay, I think I'm just going to go now. Like, never mind. Like, and then like Lee kind of starts blocking her her path, like blocking the door. And then Andy comes and is like blocking the door and she can't leave. She's at the mercy of, the, of these two mega rich 
you know, people with a bunch of secrets, like, and they're like insisting that she doesn't leave. They're, they're insisting that she stays. And she's like, no, really, I, I gotta go. Like, did you uh, see the, um, the like preview or like the little snippet, um, for the next episode that said, no, um, Darby finds the retreat within the retreat. Um, and I'm starting to think that I'm, I'm like playing with the idea again, that maybe this is all a show, like all like game, um, mm -hmm. somehow yep, to like that seems audition to be a popular thought Darby. Online. Yeah. Like to addition Darby into some cult or like some kind of, um, initiation or like hazing or like they want to see can Darby figure it out um and like are is this whole retreat just I don't know I guess that once I play that out a little bit it seems a little too far-fetched that all of this money would be spent just to get Darby to do what um but just something something feels off so okay okay I want to like that's like a half-baked idea okay um, go for it what are we thinking? Like, who do you think killed Bill? Like, at this point, I feel like they've done a really good job because I literally don't have a clue. We have all these ideas and maybes, but, like, anyone could have done it, which yeah. makes me feel like they've really done a great job at winding us up in this mystery because I have no idea. Exactly. No, I have no idea either. And um, part of me wants me wants Lee to be the killer, Part of me doesn't trust anyone and can see anyone as, as, you know, equally capable of doing it. Part of me wonders if Bill is even dead. Right. Um, maybe no one killed Bill. You know what I mean? Like, so, right. or, you know, like what if Darby killed Bill? Like, I don't trust right. anyone. I'm, yes. I don't, like not even Darby at this point, like this, this episode, one, one of the reasons that like, kind of gutted me is because I cannot trust Darby anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I was able to trust her up until this point. And then, and it wasn't even so much the drug abuse. It was, it was the, it's just the taking of, of, of risks all willy nilly that she does. No, I'm too old. <laughs> I'm too old to like find a character like that relatable. I don't even trust her anymore. I don't right. trust Ray. I don't trust Todd. I don't trust Eva. I don't trust right. none of that. Tomas, I don't trust Zoomer. I don't trust Zoomer. I, I literally do not trust anyone. And I realize that with that little scene that they had where they're like, they build a fire uh. in the courtyard. That was a really nice scene. They, again, there was like OA-ish imagery because they had like the, like the half prison. Yeah. Yes. And so there was five of them there. So maybe those are the five people that you can trust. Or Pentagon. Pentagon. Sorry. Yeah. So maybe that is, those are the five people that you can trust. Mm. Um, I've been thinking, you know, I've been kind of playing around with that idea in my head, but like, so I can see, I can see kind of what they did there. Um, but I still viscerally mistrust everyone. Um, that scene around the campfire, around the, the um, revolting bonfire. Mm. Like I was sobbing, like when um, when um, Ziba talked about um, her Iranian heritage and the nomadic lineage, um, and then the way that they were honoring the dead, and like I was literally like they were saying names. I I said Courtney Taylor Case. I said Barry uh, David Rosenzweig. Like I honored them in that moment and it was so cathartic. And when Darby, oh my God, it's going to make me emotional just thinking about it again. Like Darby not wanting to say Bill's name. Like it's so, it's so true to grief that the idea that someone is gone is so absurd that there are these things that you like can't do. Like, you can't say Courtney is dead in a sentence because it would make it more real. Like there's all these yeah. ways that you try to psychologically kind of protect yourself. And she's kind of confronted um, in this space with 
a ritual, a ceremony of, of grieving, which is so important to the process of healing anyway. But I was just, when they, when they added that scene, it just felt, I don't know. It just felt so true because they're all grieving. Sean's dead. Rohan's dead. Um, Bill is dead. And it's just, yeah, I don't know. I just, I really loved that scene. I totally forgot about it until now. Yeah. I was taken aback by Darby's reluctance. I don't have an experience with grief the way you do. Um, but I guess what I can appreciate about Darby's grief and being unable to even like vocalize, even like say it, I guess grief will make us do some weird things. Like I refuse to believe that the OA is canceled. Like maybe that is because I'm stuck in grief. I always thought it was just because I was like able to like see things differently and reimagine death, but maybe I'm stuck in grief and I can't even like accept that it's even canceled. Like I, that, that made me kind of like question myself and like realize that. Yeah. Grief will make us do some, some things that, maybe don't make the most sense, the most literal sense, like, but no one was questioning her. No one was like saying like, Oh wow, Darby, like you can't say his name. Like they were just like, okay, we get it. Like we, we get, you're not there yet and you're grief and we understand. But that was another thing that, but see, I was in my head the, almost the whole time. I was just thinking, thinking, thinking. I didn't give myself a chance to really feel. Maybe that's why that scene didn't hit me as hard. Um, Cause I was like, well, maybe Bill's not dead. And that's why you're not trying to say his name. Like, right. But again, maybe I need to watch it two, three, four more, five more times. However many times it takes for me to like, finally be able to move down the 10 stories from the old noggin down to the body. But uh, it just, it didn't happen for me um, right away. Probably because grief, because I'm already sad. I'm pre-grieving. I am pre-grieving. Right. I understand that. And grief, it doesn't, you were talking about like being stuck in grief, you know, in a lot of ways, that's true. I feel like one of the ways that I've come to understand it is grief is like a meteor, like a comet hitting the earth and it creates this crater and the crater is there forever. It changed the landscape of that area, but eventually um things grow again and and that space does fill but the landscape has changed forever and so it just takes some time before life starts to grow again in that space and you just you kind of grow around it it never it never really leaves um but you do um you know you do maybe move to a different part of of the earth um it also made me think about um, cause like, I think it was during that scene that we get the flashback. Like that's when they go back to that scene where they're fighting and Bill says that line, I feel like I'd have to be dead for you to love me. Mm. And that, that hit me so hard because I remember that's such an experience that I had with Courtney where Courtney was my best friend, like in the entire world at that point in time, you know, she's still obviously, you know, um, always going to be one of my best friends. But at the time, I had taken our relationship and her for granted. Mm-hmm. And then she dies and she's gone and I no longer can, you know, connect with her on the physical plane, body to body. And that is when my love for her became so apparent. I was able to see it. I was able to almost touch it. It was almost palpable. But it wasn't until she was gone that I learned to appreciate it. And I feel like that's such a true, you know, that's such a true experience, like the OA, you know, it wasn't until the OA was canceled that the loss of the OA and the cancellation and, and the grief. And like, we've talked about Reddit being kind of like this archive of grief. Uh, I really feel like I came to love the OA because I was never going to get it again. You know, at least that's how mm-hmm. I was feeling back in the day. Now I feel different because um, death is not a problem for the OA. But um, yeah, I feel like that's just like Britain's all are really, I really, the story is working for me. They're really touching on some culturally relevant, emotionally relevant 
collectively relevant themes about the experience of being a human being right now mm -hmm. um, and the way that people are surviving um, the opiate epidemic and the drug crisis are surviving the climate crisis are surviving the economy and just being in this world right now. I feel like they're really touching on those stories. Right. Um, I have a couple of things. I, I really love the story, the analogy you made about grief and how it like changes a lot. It's like a meteor that comes in and changes the landscape. That was beautiful. Um, I forgot the other thing already. Oh yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I had never thought of I had never thought about that phrase. I felt like you had I had to die in order for you to love me as kind of being synonymous with like you're taking me for granted mm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Like uh that's definitely a eye-opening way of looking at it. Um I wonder how true that is. Um I wonder how true that will end up being in Bill and Darby's story um, because that is a kind of a profound way of, of looking at it. You know, um, I have a Mexican heritage. My, my mother's Mexican. I'm Mexican. My mother's Mexican. And she's like <laughs> this thing that Mexican moms tend to say. And it's like, you're going to miss me when I'm dead. Like mm. it sounds a lot harsher in English, but it, you know, it's, it's said with, with, it's like a common thing that they say and um, might be taking the people you love for granted. And it might take, you know, something big, something that takes them away from you for you to realize um, exactly what, exactly what their value was um, in your life. So that's interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'm curious to see how true that is in that right. story. So, yeah. I feel like, um, you know, every life is a death and um, every love story is also like a tragedy. You know, there's an end. And I I truly, I mean, you you put it so well that, you know, it, it really is um, like a meditation on taking someone for granted because that is how I felt before grief and then after grief. Not to say that I'm free from taking people and situations for granted, um, but I've definitely gained an awareness to really savor and appreciate the moments I have when I'm connecting with people, mm -hmm. um, trying to spend more time with my loved ones and making sure that I don't leave situations, um, you know, at least not on bad terms. Mm -hmm. I, I try to resolve those kinds of conflicts because, you know, you never really know, like this really is a temporary experience. Like we pop in and we pop out. Uh, we're just a blip. Um, even if we're in an infinite, you know, ever revolving multiverse, like this experience of this version of Nick and this Ashka, you know, this, it's a, it's a story and the story does have an end. Um, it does. We're, and, we're permanent. We're sorry, not permanent. We are impermanent. Right. Yeah. But the stories themselves are eternal, but the experience of them as we have a body in them, um, you know, is, is fleeting. So I know that you and I have talked about, and we probably should dedicate, <laughs> I know I always say this, that we, we probably should dedicate um, a discussion to this, but the way Britain Zoll portray death that makes us reimagine death. Hmm. Um, like you said, every, every life is a death, sound of my voice, right? That hmm. was like a lesson that we can take from, or that, that was like something that Maggie was saying actually um, to members of her cult. Um, we can learn from the OA that like the OA, for example, is a deathless character. Like she, even if she's, you can't cancel her in a way that matters. Netflix count her <laughs> days. Like, um, you know, she is going, God, this sounds so corny. Uh, let it out. Let it out. Return. Like, <laughs> you know, she's coming back. Um, no, but for real, she's a deathless character. Um, she will be back in some different iteration. Who knows if that's what we're witnessing right now? Um, I think it absolutely is. is. I think you that, think so? yes, I think to save the OA is like a cultural revolution. I feel like, mm -hmm. okay, now this is, I'm just going to say it too. I feel a little bit vulnerable when I speak, <laughs> my, when I speak my B and Z truths, but I feel like 
we were talking a little bit about collectivism being like a bomb for mm -hmm. um, the rawness of being in the world. I feel like the OA and B and Z storytelling is like cultural medicine, and mm. that the story of the OA of the OA and the cultural relevance and the the contemporary mythology that they're weaving into this realm that to save the OA the o the OA can only return if the story is working and we we like this medicine comes through i it's still i'm still working on like figuring out what i mean by this but um i really feel like you know, Zal keeps talking about the conditions need to be right. I feel like there needs to be a change in the streaming services and the relationship of, you know, the audience to these stories. There's so many, there's so many pieces that need to happen. And the story, all the seeds have been planted, but they haven't bloomed yet. They're still, they're still in the soil. And and maybe, maybe what we're doing now is kind of helping the soil become nutritious with these other stories. But I really feel like, uh, I wish that I could say it more eloquently because I like feel it in my body, but I, I can't quite articulate it just yet. But I feel like the OA is absolutely going to return, but it's, it's when this, as the story continues to work, like we're not mm -hmm. ready. The collective is not, it's not, it's not ready. So it's not going to emerge yet but it mm. will be. I have complete faith that this story is so much bigger than Britain's All. It's not just the OA. It's not just a murder at the end of the world. It's the story. And this story, if I'm talking like Gnostic terms, is like Sophia coming through um, and giving us some um, conceptual, spiritual tools to kind of fight the archons and the powers that be. To and escape the, story, the demiurge. The our Gnostic powers being um, shared with us in plain sight in the form of fiction and that the OA returning like will coincide with a kind of cultural revolution. Like I, I feel like so. saving the OA represents like a complete paradigm shift that needs to take place in order for this story to, to be able to, to be free in this realm. Yes, 100% to all of that. And, you know, all I really have to add is something that I saw said on Discord, which is, you know, death never really feels final with Britain's all. There's something about the way they portray it. Death that, is not an end. Yeah, death is not the end. And so I think that's a really good um, kind of place to, to wrap up. Um, they said anything you want to add is like any like theories or predictions you want to add at this point before we close out. I just want to say that you know Brit Brit promised to the True Blue fans that they will find a way. <laughs> they will find a way to keep telling this story. Hmm. This story is so much more powerful. It is beyond the cancellation of one iteration of this story on one streaming service. The story is so much bigger and they, they're, they're finding a way this story. You can't stop the story. We're living it. We're what all a part of it. What if they're telling the, what if they're telling the OA with their hands tied behind their backs? And like, if you can imagine if we like delve into that metaphor, like what, I'm trying to close out the show, dang. But here we go. Like, what if, like, their hands tied behind their backs is, like, you know, like, all the red tape and, like, who owns the the, the intellectual property and, like, copyright right. and bing, bong, bing, things I don't even know and shouldn't even be talking about. Like, what if that's, those are the things that are tying their hands behind their back and, you know, the cancellation and and they're still trying to, it's almost like if you take all the pieces of a murder at the end of the world, or I'm sorry, if you take all the, if you made a jigsaw puzzle out of the story that is the OA and you break that jigsaw puzzle into its tiny million, tiny little pieces, and then you rearrange those pieces and you fit them together differently and you end up getting a different picture. Then what if that's what we're looking at with a murder at the end? That's my biggest prediction so far. I mean, it's based on 
I was going to say based on nothing, but that's not true. It's based on pattern recognition and it's based on the way that this work, even at the end of chapter five, is so uh, intrinsically connected to the OA. We're seeing like super, I mean, you cannot ignore the the what well, Easter eggs, but but they're not coincidences, you know, they're they're there on purpose. And I think that, you know, you know, what if that is what we're seeing? They're still you know, being they're, they're still yeah. being the they their storytelling powers are only evolving. They're gonna continue mm -hmm. to tell stories. They're gonna find a way to keep telling these stories. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing. This is just a story within the story. It really is all connected because we're all connected in this one big divine story, but they are mm -hmm. granting us access. I feel like if the culture is so sick, the collective is, is really, it's on the mend. I truly believe it's on the mend, but it's also very sick. Their contemporary mythologies are the exact medicine that this culture needs and it's working. The stories are working. We just have to have faith. We have to keep believing um, we have to lean in and we have to connect to our own storytelling powers now more than ever. <sighs> what a great way to, to actually close out. Um, thank you for, thank you everyone for coming in and joining this conversation. If you have any thoughts on episode five, let us know. Is, is this your favorite episode? Britain's all said it was their favorite episode. So what do you think? Do you agree? Disagree? Are you somewhere in the middle? Let us know. Check us out on Instagram and don't forget to like and subscribe.